great to be back with you again. I get the two o'clock hour, oh my word. <laughs> now the assignment that I was given for this session was, we want you to spark their imaginations, help them to dream, and tie it all together, the entire conference, giving them foundational principles with which to move forward and the next steps they're supposed to take, regardless of what walk of life they're in. Right. So I have to be Jesus here. So that's not going to happen. But what, what we're going to try to do here is, is um, again, going back to this issue of poverty, we're going to go back and, and look at kind of two case studies, so to speak. And we're going to start off in the country of Rwanda. But before I do that, I, I can't help myself. I want to I ask you a question. I want you to think about some quality, some quality that you've inherited from your grandfather or maybe your grandmother. Could be a positive quality, could be a negative quality, but can you think of anything about yourself that you can say, you know what, this comes from my grandfather or my grandmother? Do you have one? Can you identify one? I can tell you that a large part of who I am, both positively and negatively, comes from my grandfather. I mentioned yesterday I got to meet with, one of my, with my aunt, who's 83 years old here in a nursing home, and my word, it's like we're clones. It's terrifying. Now, what's the point? Well, why don't you all just get over it? Well, why don't you all just get over what you've inherited? Y you see, we can't. We, we inherit a lot of stuff. And see, for those of us who are Caucasian, our response to African-American communities, why can't you all get over it? But you see, the images that we saw earlier were taking place when my grandfather was alive. There's stuff that happened to my grandfather that has been transmitted to me and I can't get over it. And I've had all the opportunities in life possible. At the time that those lynchings were happening, other things were happening to my grandfather that, that, that are in my DNA that I, I can't get away from it. I can't just get over it. And yet that's our message to the African American community. Why can't you just get over it? And of course, the history hasn't ended either. The stories that we're hearing about what's going on in our cities right now across the country, and in Kansas City in particular, are, 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 are shocking. And so we need, we need repentance. We need to come together as the body of Christ and to own this. That's not my talk. My talk is this. This is a title they gave me. It's also the title of Matt Perlman's book. Matt's here today. Uh, what's Best Next? We're plagiarizing his title. I didn't do it. They gave it to me. Here we go. We're going to start off in the country of Rwanda. What we're going to do here is look at a, a very different setting from what we're in because I want to use that setting to illustrate some principles. Sometimes when you get outside of your own setting, you can see some things more clearly. Then what we're going to do is come back to a very concrete situation that every one of our churches is facing. And we're going to ask, how can we apply those principles that we're going to learn from Rwanda in a setting that all of our churches experience here in an everyday situation? So here we go. This is the country of Rwanda. Many of you know that 20 years ago, a genocide broke out in Rwanda. One tribe decided to try to annihilate another tribe. Husbands killed their wives if they were from a different tribe. The dean of a college planned the execution of 500 of his own students. This church is the scene of a horrendous incident. The pastor of this church went out into the community and said to the oppressed tribe, come into the church, find sanctuary in the church, I will protect you. And the folks came in the church and it was a trick. He had his henchmen bolt the doors. They went up on the roof, they pulled back the thatch, and they shot at everything below. They came down and took machetes, one of which is left here on the Lord's table at the front of the church. They took machetes, they hacked people apart, they picked up babies and slammed them against walls. Time Magazine ran a cover story that said there's no more demons in hell. They've all been unleashed in the country of Rwanda. We have racist issues, racial problems going on in Kansas City, but in Rwanda, my word. 
And what's really shocking is it's not even clear that these two tribes are different tribes. It's not actually clear that these are actually two different people groups. That's another whole story. This is a picture of a church in Rwanda today. It's important that it's a church. We'll come back to that later. I'm going to tell a story. We're going to use this story to illustrate some points. These women are members of that church. And unfortunately, these women have a very hard time finding work. A lot of our conference here has been about work. These women have a very hard time finding work because there's simply not enough jobs in most of the majority world of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. There certainly are not enough jobs in Rwanda. So they have to become self-employed. They have to start their own small businesses. They have to be entrepreneurial. The problem is they can't access capital. See, to get capital, you either have to save or you have to borrow. But there's no banks available to these women. They can't save and they can't borrow. So what they have to do is rely on loan sharks. There are loan sharks that charge them between 300% and 1,200% interest per year for borrowing small amounts of money to start small businesses. Sometimes they would prefer to save. In fact, most poor people, this might shock you, most poor people around the world would actually rather save than borrow. These women would like to save. There are sometimes what they call savings sharks. They will go around collecting people's savings, hide it under a rock. Maybe they've got a gun or a Rottweiler or a big Dutch husband. There's something about them that makes them... There's some, <laughs> this just comes out. You're supposed to be praying, Michael. <laughs> there are people who go door to door and collect people's savings, put it into a safe place, but they charge for the privilege of saving. They charge about 80% interest. Are you tracking with me? You put $100 in the bank at the end of the year, you get 20 back. 80% for the privilege of saving. Now, if people are willing to pay a lot of money for something, it means they value it. If you're willing to pay this much money to borrow and this much money to save, it must mean that you really need capital. Why do you need capital? To start a small business. There's other reasons as well, but we're going to make the story very simple. It's a matter of life and death. You need to have a business to, to, to survive to be able to support your families. What microfinance does, microfinance tries to address this situation. Microfinance is a particular poverty alleviation strategy that tries to provide banking services, savings, and loans to very poor people like this. The Chalmers Center that I founded by God's grace asked the question, how can we help women like this in Rwanda to get the capital they need so that they can work? We're trying to solve a very practical problem. How can we help these women to get the capital that they need so that they can work. We want to address some other needs as well, but we we're particularly focused on work. And so we started doing, we did a lot of research. We wanted to help that local church there to help these women. How can we help that local church to help these women? And so we, 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 we did a lot of research. We read a lot of best practices about microfinance. It turns out you can do a lot of harm in microfinance. We tried to figure out what could a local church do, and everybody told us we were crazy. They all said the local church can't be involved in this. It's nuts. The local church is about preaching. It's about spiritual things. It can't be involved in microfinance. They said it'll never work. The Dutch are hard-headed. It's not just the wooden shoes that are hard. It's up here, too. So we plowed forward, a handful of us, three or four of us, trying to figure this out. And what we did is we said, let's start with what they have. Let's start with their gifts and their resources. And it turns out that there are th some, there's something called a savings and credit association. It's actually indigenous to the culture. It's like a very small, very primitive credit union in which the poor come together and they save and lend their own money to one another. There's no outside capital at all. All the money comes from these women. Some of the poorest women in the world, if you help them, can actually save and lend their own money to one another. You also notice in this picture, go back, you were, oh my word. That's all right. We'd have a broken relationship in the leadership of the Chalmers Center. The, 
These women come together, they save and lend their own money to one another. They run their own very small, very primitive credit union. You notice there's no white faces here. These women own and operate their own credit union with their own money. And when they get together, it's not just about money, as important as that is. It's about prayer. It's about Bible study. It's about worship. It's about community. It's about reconciliation. You see, some of the women in this, in this picture are from one tribe, and some of the women in this picture are from the other tribe that was oppressing them. Some of these women have husbands who killed the husbands of the other women in this picture. But in the local church, Jesus Christ shows up, and reconciliation can happen. One step at a time, these women have been able to reconcile with each other. They go into the prisons. They minister to the murderers in prisons. And when the murderers are released, these are the entree back into the community. These women are the entree back into the community for the husbands. It's the kingdom of God coming to bear in one of the darkest places in the world. And they're not alone. The Chalmers Center has been able to partner with another organization called Hope International and the Anglican Church of Rwanda so that there's about 200,000 people in these savings and credit associations. The poorest people on the planet have saved over $5 million. Not a dime of outside money, no white faces. The poorest people on the planet who are hacking each other apart with machetes have accomplished this. Now, what's the secret? What's the secret Coke formula to making this happen? This is what you all paid big bucks for to come to this conference. Here we go. Here's the Coke formula. It's God. I told you yesterday, poverty alleviation is a miracle. I really meant it. It's God. Here's the second step in the whole process. Number two, it's God. And if you recall, he's three in one. It's God. It's a miracle. That's the story. It's a miracle. But there are some basic principles as well that flow out of a biblical theory of change as those basic principles I want to try to draw out for you uh, in the short amount of time we have today. Well, now what's a theory of change? A theory of change answers two questions. Number one, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? And the second question a theory of change answers is this. How do we try to achieve our goal? What's the goal, and how are we going to get there, all right? What I'd like you to do to kind of ground this work a little bit is this. Choose a ministry with which you are familiar. So choose one. You've got to, if you don't have pen and paper out, you fail the course. You've got to get out a piece of paper and a pencil for this last workshop, or Jesus is going to come in your life. (laughs) You might stay with the Kansas City Chiefs the rest of your life instead of the Green Bay Packers. I see a brother over here who's close to the Godhead wearing his Green Bay Packers shirt. Boy, he's, he's bold. Choose a ministry that you're familiar with. Maybe it's one that you're involved with. Maybe it's part of your church. But choose a particular ministry. It could be a housing ministry. It could be a daycare ministry. It could be an ESL program. Choose some ministry that you are familiar with. What I'd like you to do is to consider the theory of change in your ministry. Consider the theory of change in that ministry. Number one, what is the goal of the ministry? Number two, how does the ministry try to achieve the goal? So I'll just give you a second. What is the goal, and how does the ministry try to achieve the goal? That second question, you might look at the components of the ministry. What are the ingredients in the ministry? What are the components, the features of the ministry? What are they relying on to try to achieve the goal? Yesterday, what we did is we considered a biblical theory of change. That's what we were doing. And so we're going to review that in 15 seconds. You ready? We start with creation, and we said that human beings are image bearers, and that to be an image bearer is to live with your entire personhood 
mind, heart, actions, and bodies in right relationship to God, self, others, and the rest of creation. And so that was the creation story. We got to the fall, and the fall what we saw is that human beings are broken. Because we have a broken relationship with God, it radiates through our entire personhood. We then create broken social systems, broken economic systems, broken political systems, broken religious systems, and those systems come back to enslave us. We also said that there's demonic forces at work. So we said poverty is caused by three things. It's caused by broken individuals, broken systems, and demonic forces that all work together. Then we got to the idea of redemption. What we saw there is the good news that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's using his power and his authorities to set things right again by reclaiming broken individuals, by reclaiming broken systems, and by conquering demonic forces. And so what we want to say here right now is that a biblical theory of change is this, that the goal, the goal for human beings is image bearing. The goal is restoration to image bearing, and the primary way of getting there is King Jesus. That's what we did last night. In a biblical theory of change for the poor, the goal is restoration to image bearing, and the way to get there is King Jesus. And it's out of that framework and the applications of the implications of this framework that we designed our work in Rwanda. Now, I wish I had more time to unpack all that, but I'm going to show you a few key principles that, that come out of this basic theory of change that inform what we did in Rwanda. They may be able to inform you in your work and in your ministries. If you want more details about this, there's a book that's on sale here called From Dependence to Dignity that goes into this in much greater detail. But let's put it into practice real quickly. Now, you should be thinking, you should be thinking about your own ministries right now. When we approached these women, we came from the perspective of, you know what? Their situation has a material dimension to it, but it's not fundamentally solely material. And if we simply try to provide handouts to them over long periods of time, we're not going to empower them. We're actually going to create dependency. You see, the human being is wired to work, we said. And so simply giving handouts to able-bodied people over long periods of time will cripple them. So that was one principle that we brought to bear on that situation. Principle number two. Rather than focusing on needs, we decided to focus on identifying and mobilizing assets. You see, most Westerners, when they go into that situation, will say, these people are very poor, let's give them things, or we might say, let's bring in a lot of loan capital and run a bank for them. And we started off saying, and by the way, I should say that all of this are things that people on my staff taught to me, I would have done all the wrong things. All the wrong things. But what my staff said to me is, Brian, let's focus on their assets, Let's focus on what they have. Well, what do they have? To, from the Western perspective, they've got, they've got nothing. They're living on twenty-five a day. And one of my staff members said, Brian, they can save. I thought he was insane. He's the co-author on the book I just mentioned. He said, they can save. I said, I don't believe you. He said, they can save. The research shows they can save. Nobody believed him. But he had eyes that said, let's look for the assets. They can save. And you know what else he said? He said, they actually can run savings and credit associations. They're indigenous to the culture. We don't have to bring in some foreign construct. There's something that the poorest people in the planet have actually developed on their own. And what we're going to do is come, come alongside of them and strengthen what's already there. They already know something. Let's strengthen what's already there and build upon what's already there. They can own and operate these things on their own. We can't do it on Wall Street. The rate of return, i got to tell you a little secret here. The rate of return on the savings in these savings and credit associations is something that all of us in the room would die for, especially the last three weeks. It's been brutal. I've lost a lot of money in the last three weeks. The rate of return on people's savings is often as high as 50%. Focus on identifying local assets. I, go back. We're not done with that one yet. Poor Michael. There's spiritual assets there. I don't have to bring the gospel to Rwanda. They know it. I'm from an ecclesiastical tradition that emphasizes the sovereignty of God. 
It's pretty hard to trust the sovereignty of God when you've got life insurance policies, health insurance policies, two cars in the driveway, every comfort in life. Sit at the feet of women who are living on $1.25 a day, whose husbands have been hacked apart, whose kids are the verge of starvation, who come together and pray, Jehovah Jireh, provide for me today, and try lecturing them on the sovereignty of God and how they should trust in him. It's humiliating. You just shut up and you sit at their feet and you listen. You listen to them. Because they know a whole lot more about it than I will ever know. There's spiritual assets there. There's a church there. And Christ has bound himself to that church and said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's the most incredible asset in the whole world. And it's already there. I'm not bringing Christ to Rwanda. He's there already. Focus on identifying local assets. The primary manifestation of Jesus Christ in a community is the church that's already there. The primary asset in any community is the church that's already there. Next one, principle three. Use participatory rather than blueprint approaches. What most of us want to do is figure out what poor people need and go and do it to them. I love that approach. It's efficient. And it treats the poor like rats in a maze. We talked yesterday about the fact that many of us have God complexes. Many poor people have a sense of inferiority. When you approach that dynamic with a blueprint that you figured out in your office or in your church and you go and do it to them, it exacerbates the very dynamic we're trying to get out of. It says, we're God. We know what you need. We're going to do it to you. And you're going to listen to us. A participatory approach says, those women in Rwanda, they're living there. It's their country. It's their community. It's their church. God has placed them as the primary stewards in that setting. They're the ones who are to live in right relationship to creation in that setting. And so what right do I have to go and tell them what to do? Rather, a participatory approach says, let's treat them as image bearers and ask them what they think should be done. Let's ask them how they think it should be done. And let's ask them at the end of the, at the, end of the program how successful they think it was. It's a different mindset. Fourth principle, create groups of supportive people to provide encouragement and accountability and to address broken systems. Most of us can't change on our own. We need groups of supportive people that cheer us on, that call us out when we mess up. Most of us need accountability. We need groups of supportive people around us to provide that accountability and encouragement. And as we're going to see later on in this workshop, those groups can also start to affect systemic change because there's power in the group. We're going to talk about that in the U.S. context a little bit later on. Those savings and credit associations inherently do that. It's a group structure. Next principle. Use words to introduce people to King Jesus. I talked about this last night. Broken people need restoration to communion with the creator because that's what we're wired for. You can't be fully human without being in relationship with God Almighty. And that communion is restored through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you don't get united to Jesus Christ without somebody explaining the gospel to you. You can't get there by watching people do nice things for you. You can't get there by looking at creation and at nature. Yes, Romans 1 says that those reveal the glory of God, but it's not salvific. Salvation comes from hearing the gospel declared to you. We've got broken individuals... In my analogy, the spoke is missing in the tire. The structure of the human being is messed up. But what the Bible teaches is that those who are in Christ, those who are united to him through saving faith, actually become new creatures 
It's a fundamentally different kind of, hu- of, of, of it's restoration to humanness. You go from one kind of creature into another kind of creature. That's what salvation does. It's not just solving our legal problem. It's restoration of the individual. I've got bad news for you. This is a conference on the common good. I believe in that. We should love our communities. We should celebrate the good that's there. We should celebrate the Kansas City Royals. I'm trying to connect a little bit better with you. We should celebrate that the Kansas City Chiefs will have the number one pick in the draft next year. We should... (laughs) Celebrate the symphony. Celebrate the music. Celebrate the park. Celebrate all that's good and rich here. But folks, what's really good is not common. What's really good is Jesus. And he's not common. What's really good is being united to the person of Jesus Christ. If you don't have that, you're missing out on the most important thing. What's best next? Jesus. Not Star Trek Jesus, but King Jesus. That's what's best next. Let's not lose sight of that as we're trying to love our city. It is not loving. It is not loving. I want to be careful. We want to affirm what is good there, but it is not loving to hold back on the final answer. It's not. Number six, connect people to the local church family and the ordinary means of grace, the preaching of the word, the administration of the Lord's Supper, fellowship, prayer, and church discipline. These are the ordinary means that God has ordained to communicate Christ to people. The local church is central in poverty alleviation. Number seven, start by identifying, oh, I gotta stop. Folks, the, the construction of that savings group, I forgot to mention. The fact that that savings group was so closely aligned with that church was by design. And I need more time to unpack that. But that savings group, while separate from the church in a legal sense, is rooted in that church and flows back into it again. So that the poor see the local church as the one who is ministering to them. That takes quite a bit to construct that, but it's a very intentional design. We don't want poor people to ever hear of the Chalmers Center. Rather, we want the poor to be drawn into the life of the local church because they see Christ as embodied there. So we are very, very invisible in our work, particularly in Rwanda. The biggest success the Chalmers Center has had is in Rwanda, and I've never been there. And I'll think about the dynamics of that in my life. All my staff say, well, the biggest success we ever had, Brian, is where you didn't show up. The less visible I am, the better things go. You see, when I show up, I communicate power, I communicate wealth. They're used to the answers coming from the outside. The less visible our American staff are, the better things go here. So we did not start a savings group. We train indigenous trainers. Those indigenous trainers train the local church, and the local church started the savings group. It takes a lot of intentionality to get something done, but to stay as far removed from it as possible. Think about that. It's really tough. Start by identifying best practices to adjust broken systems at the micro level. There's a broken financial system in this story. It's the broken financial system in Rwanda. It's part of an overall broken economy. Now, if you want to address the problem, figure out best practice solutions. Don't do dumb things. Christians do a lot of dumb things. We think that because we love Jesus, we get, an ex- we, we get a pass. We're going to do crummy work because we love Jesus. No. He's the king of the whole thing. Jesus created finance. You don't want crappy work done. Sorry, I'm Dutch. I talk like that. You don't want lousy work done. Find out the best practices. Be excellent because our king reigns. 
Start at a micro level. Guys, I can't change the global financial system. I can't change the financial system in Rwanda. But I can change it in that little setting for those 15 women. I can help create an alternative financial system for those 15 women that helps them flourish. That's where I began. That's where we began. Once you got something that's working, look for ways to collaborate to bring it macro. The Chalmers Center is a tiny organization. We could have never scaled it up to 200,000 savings groups members. We had to collaborate. We looked for larger organizations like Hope International, the Anglican Church of Rwanda. So we started, we piloted something, and then our attitude was, how can we collaborate with people to get it out there on a larger scale? And there's some lessons in there for all of us. Putting into practice here. All those principles, what does that mean for you? Well, the problem is you're all working in 15 different sectors. I can't help all of you. So what we're going to do is we're going to root our next example in a, in a very common situation that every one of your churches is facing. We're going to look at how you might apply those principles in this particular situation that every church here faces on a weekly basis, and that's this. A woman comes into your church asking for help to pay her electric bill. What do you do? Every one of your churches faces it, and every one of you, regardless of your vocation and your calling, can participate in God's theory of change in this woman's life. Somebody came up to me at break and said, I work in IT, what can I do? You have a role in this moment. I met somebody else over here who's involved in law. She has a role in this moment. I met somebody else who's involved in helping to uh, strengthen families. She has a role in this moment. Even the pastors in the room could be useful in this moment. Now, what does this look like? What does this look like? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of chart for you a path, and the pathway I'm going to chart incorporates all the principles that is laid out. Now, I'm not going to have time to, to draw that all out, but I need you to simply know that the principles we just drew out are all part of the story we're going to tell right now. So what do you do? There's basically a four-step process that we would advise a church like this to use. Now, some of you are going, I'm not involved in that ministry. I know, this is a case study that you're supposed to learn from. Four-step process. Assess and mobilize, learn, adopt, and explore. Four steps. All right? Assess and mobilize. Number one, start by looking at assets. What are the gifts of your church or your ministry? What assets do you have that you can bring to bear on this woman's life? I had a brother talk to me this morning. He said, I, I'm so frustrated. He said, I'm so frustrated. He said, he said my church doesn't use my gifts. And he said, it, it's, it's, it's making me angry because they don't use my gifts. I, I don't have a way to express my talents in my church. When you have talents and gifts that you can't express, it, it, it's frustrating. That's what unemployment is like. It's frustrating. You start to doubt yourself. You start to doubt your capacity. You start to get depressed. The church often doesn't understand the gifts that it has and mobilize those gifts. The first thing is figure out what your congregation's got. You need a lot of things in this situation, but here's the most important thing that you need. What you need are groups of supportive people who are willing to walk with this woman across time. Poverty is rooted in broken relationships. We need relational approaches to help in the process of restoration to image bearing. There are a number of models of this, but one model that I like in particular is called the circle of support model. And the idea here is that a group of people will agree to be what are called allies for this woman. They are willing to come around her, forming a circle of, su of support. Now, it's very... guys. These kinds of relationships are not always positive. Because what can happen is the allies can actually be very condescending, can be demeaning, can basically communicate the message to the woman, you're less than I am, why don't you, why don't you be like I am? So the posture, the most important element of one of those allies in that group on the, that's pictured at the top, the most important thing for them is they understand the gospel. They understand they're broken. The primary qualification to be a good ally is that you know that you stink without Jesus. That's the qualification. That woman can be trained to be called what's the circle leader. 
instead of having a group of mentors and a mentee, you try to change this power dynamic and you say there's allies and there's the circle leader. The circle leader is the woman who just came into your church asking for help with her electric bill. And what you can do is you can equip her to articulate to this group of people what her goals are for her life, what resources and gifts that she has that she can use to achieve those goals, the kinds of things that she thinks that she could use from the circle to support her, and the circle can then decide whether or not to provide those things or not, and they can hold her accountable. That circle, that circle does more than just encourage, it does more than just provide accountability. This is extremely important for you to get. We've got poverty rooted in broken individuals. The group is going to help with that. We also have poverty rooted in broken systems, and that group is going to help with that too. You see, this circle of people are people who probably have access to social networks this woman doesn't have. They have access to job opportunities this woman doesn't have. They have access to a police force and a prosecutor, and a banker that she doesn't have. See, the problem for us is that we have incredible, uh, our brother this morning, um, brother, I can't remember your name. He was talking about, he was, brother Stan was talking about the, the, the difficulty of simply having an African-American name. How do you all get your jobs? How do, I got my job because I knew somebody. That's how we all get our jobs. We know somebody. What if you don't know anybody who's got jobs because of several hundred years of racial oppression? You don't have access to the system. The system can't work for you. You don't even have access to it. He was telling me at break time about a situation he was in as a young man where he got a speeding ticket. And because he was on a football team with a white kid, and the white kid's dad knew the prosecutor, they were able to get it adjusted. We have access to networks, we have access to power that we don't understand. All of that's brought to bear in this woman's life by that circle of support. Next step, learn about existing organizations and services in your area. Again, an asset-based approach. Find out what's already going on. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Maybe there's all kinds of ministries and services in your community that you can access and use to help this woman move ahead. Maybe there's a financial education ministry. Maybe there's somebody who understands how to deal with the electric company. Maybe there's somebody who understands housing. There's ministries that exist. Find out what's already there. Here's a, a, a set of resources that you can use to find out what already exists in the community. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Use an asset-based approach. Now, the point here is not to outsource everything. So, so some people think, oh, good. I can find out where all the ministries are, so we don't have to deal with this woman. So what we're going to do is have a Rolodex. And she's going to come in, and we're going to, oh, you've got this problem. Oh, we know a ministry. Here's the address. Go find them. Poverty is rooted in broken relationships. It takes relational approaches to restore the poor. The idea is to say to the lady, you know what, you're having issues with your uh, electric bill. We know of an organization that can help you with that. Let's go there together. Let's walk through this together and walk together with her in the months and years that follow that meeting. Next step, adopt Asset-based participatory first encounter policies. That's a mouthful. You want to have policies and procedures in place so that when she comes in and asks for help, that you have some guidelines that will shape how you will work with her. Some people would call these benevolence policies. Guidelines that will shape the conditions under which you will provide her assistance. But then there's a second piece of these intake policies that we want to get to, and that's the idea of an action plan. Instead of the entire dynamic being, you need money for your electric bill, here's money, how about this for an approach? Ma'am, you're asking us for help with your electric bill, we can talk about that, but, but we'd like to really get involved in your life. You, you, you see, the electric bill thing is just a symptom of something deeper. We'd love to get more involved in your life. And, and, and you know, we're curious. What, what are your long-term goals and dreams? 
What are you trying to accomplish in your life? What strengths, abilities, and resources can you use to achieve those goals? What's the first action you will take to achieve those goals? By what date will you achieve this action? This is an asset-based participatory approach. It's putting the ownership of the situation on the person and saying, you're sitting there thinking, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you help yourself. We're going to walk with you. Now, some of this may not sound very powerful to you, but that's because we don't have marred self-images as much. When you are dealing with people who've been told sometimes for centuries that they are part of a people group that is the scum of the earth, saying to the person, what gifts do you have? The question alone can be poverty alleviation. It's a question that says, you are made in the image of God, you have dignity and worth and capacity, I believe it and I can see it. And let's discover that image bearing together. The question is outrageously powerful in some things. I've seen it happen, I participated in this myself. It doesn't feel powerful, does it? A lot of people, when we don't want to help, it hurts. The, the first edition, they said, when we understand the critique, we don't think you've told us what to do. Well, it's possible we didn't communicate clearly. Another possibility is that what we're telling you to do doesn't sound like anything because we come out of a material framework. We think poverty alleviation is about stuff. We don't understand that's recovery of the human condition, of the recovery of human dignity. Then you say to people who have been oppressed, what gifts do you have? It can unleash the image of God in them. I've seen it happen many times. Next slide. How can we support you in achieving your goals? Would you be willing to have a support person or a support team, that circle of support we talked about? Would you be open to having a group of people walk with you and encourage you? Can we meet with you again to check on you? It's an asset-based approach to working with this woman. All this is articulated more fully in a book that's coming out on Tuesday called Help, Helping Without Hurting in Church Benevolence that walks through this all in much greater detail. Next step, explore the possibility of starting a new ministry. What's going to happen, what's going to happen is as you're working with people in this situation, you're going to discover there's gaps in the service provision. You're going to discover that there's, there's things missing, that, that needs that women in this situation often have, and there's simply nobody else doing this in your community, and, and that if you could actually start a new ministry, you might really be able to help. So there's two that we would suggest to you. The first is financial education. But it's not really just financial education. It can be done in a way that's highly relational and higher, highly empowering. The Chalmers Center has launched something called Faith and Finances, and it's a safe place. You're, ask, you're looking for next steps. It's a safe space where materially well-off and materially poor come together and community is fostered. It's very difficult for some of us to connect cross-culturally. But it is possible, if constructed properly, to come together in a safe space where the materially well-off and the materially poor have some level of equal playing field. We've seen outrageous things happen in this ministry. We recently, recently there was a situation, they were talking about money, and, and one of the allies, one of the, one of the wealthy people in the room said, I saw the craziest thing six months ago. I was in pennies, and somebody, somebody uh, stole something, and they caught her, and she was screaming bloody murder, and she was out of control, and she was wild. And one of the participants in the class said, yeah, that was me. the space was safe enough that she felt like she could say it. It's the gospel showing up. Jobs preparedness ministry. You can help people get off of welfare and into the workforce by walking them through jobs preparedness training, but then the allies are also helping them find jobs. We saw a lot of people raise their hands in here today saying that they're business people. You have a huge role to play. You need to provide jobs for these people. It's one thing to say to a person, you need to have a stronger work ethic. Another thing to say, 
as you struggle with that, we're going to provide you with a real job. You all, the, the gentleman in the IT world, you've got connections to employers. Somebody's got to give the person a chance. And somebody's got to be sacrificial about it so that when the person starts to struggle, they don't show up for work, the employer says, all right, two steps forward, one step back. I'm going to sacrificially try to work to help restore this person. We have a new curriculum and training program called Work Life. It's very similar to Faith and Finances, but this focuses on work. We've developed it with Jobs for Life, a national organization, and an inner city ministry called Advance Memphis. I want to show you a very short video clip from the Work Life training process to give you a vision for what that could look like. People just look at, oh, they're all dope boys, or they're all robbers and things of that nature, but um, everything starts from somewhere. They don't understand our struggle as far as growing up in a single parent home and mom not being able to pay the bills and here you are living in a neighborhood and you have all of these people who are doing all these illegal things to make this money and you're looking at your brother and sister who are hungry every night and you just go out and do what you can to provide for the family. We only look at the, uh, the root, the tree of the problem, we don't look at the root. When I came out of high school, I had an opportunity to go to college and I kind of backed away from it because I didn't have the, um, I guess you could say, the support system that would support me and push me and motivate me. So I kind of was uh, wandering around as far as what I would do. One week you may work 40 hours, the next week you may work 20 hours. So you can't consistently guarantee you know, as far as paying bills and things of that nature, it's good to have a full-time job knowing that when I get up in the morning, I am guaranteed to go to work in the morning. The number one guy in charge is just faith. You know, just trusting in God that he'll make a way and he'll provide. The cornerstone verse for me in my life has been Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And so once I really just uh, zeroed in on what God really meant in the verse, you know, that's when my life began to change. As that circle of support is coming around people and helping them with financial education, as it's coming around people and helping them uh, find a job, what's going to happen is that circle of support is not only going to be encouraging that person, providing accountability, they're going to be pushing back against those systems that are broken, and then something else can happen. Sometimes you're going to start to notice the systems are so profoundly broken that it's not just about access to the system, it's about changing the system. And there's things you can do to make that happen. There's something called community organizing. Some of you don't like President Obama. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. He was a community organizer, but get over it. It could still be a good strategy. Community organizing is a strategy that you can use to uh, identify community leaders and help them to take actions on things that they care about to change their community. And that can unleash a spiraling process that can lead to larger systemic change. Uh, <clears throat> All of that is discussed further in part four of the second edition when Helping Hurts. Now, second only to loving the Green Bay Packers, if you would all read part four, you'd make me very happy. Nobody ever reads part four. All the truth you need is in part four. You've got to get to part four. If you want more information, you can go to our website real quickly. Real quickly. Think about your ministry. Are there one or two principles that you believe your ministry could benefit from applying more effectively? Have all the stuff we just covered. Are there one or two principles? Write them down. Write them down. One or two principles. And what specific actions will you take in the next two weeks to begin to improve your ministry in this area? So just think for, we don't have a lot of time, just think for a few seconds. Is there anything that you can glean, anything that you can glean from all the principles we just talked about, from the examples we talked about, are there any actions that you could take in the next couple of weeks to just start moving forward? To just start moving forward a little bit. Think for just a minute. Just turn to your neighbor and just share. If you, if you don't have anything, just say you love them or something. 
Just turn to your neighbor and share. I hate when my pastor does that. It's so awkward. If I could just draw your attention back, I know you need more time and you can continue these conversations in the days and weeks ahead. There's one more thing I want to remind ourselves about, and that's this. The most important thing at the center of God's theory of change is this one. It's repentance. It's repentance of material understanding of the world. It's repentance of our pride and our sense of superiority. And it's embracing the good news of King Jesus, that he's making all things new. And that he starts with dirty, rotten, crummy people like you and me. That's the good news of the gospel. And it's in that king and in that gospel that our ultimate hope is. Thanks for the chance to be with you.